Hello, my name is Christian Reynolds and I will be presenting a paper today entitled Tipping the Scales, a new understanding of food's power in the political sphere for the 5th International Conference on the Interdisciplinary Social Sciences from the 2nd to the 5th of August 2010. I do apologise for the segmented nature of this presentation, though being a YouTube presentation it has had to be divided at the 10 minute mark. And if we are talking about food, we must of course mention the great French lawyer, politician and gastronome Briette Savran, and he has a great quote to open up the ideas around food and politics, the quote being, the fate of nations depends on the way they eat. 185 years after Briette Savran penned the above, in what would become a costly blunder for the French Olympic Games bid, the President of France, Jacques Chirac, once again proved the veracity of the well-known aphorism by Briette Savran by voicing his opinion of the English and their food. He said, and I quote, You can't trust people who cook as badly as that. After Finland, it's the country with the worst food. The only thing the British have given ag European agriculture is the mad cow. Now, this was a very inflammatory remark, and it spread quickly throughout the global media, and it incited Finland, who was one of the few voting countries who did not cast their vote, to cast it against France's bid and for England's, thereby assuring that London hosted the 2012 Olympic Games. This brief story is but one example that illustrates that food, as a symbolic and consumable item, has power in politics. Yet few traditional theoretical political ideologies, such as realism, liberalism, constructivism, etc., consider food as having a great impact in the political sphere. In this paper, I seek to create a set of theoretical frameworks that can examine and investigate how food is utilised as a form of political power in international politics. So let me begin by acknowledging that food is an emotive, powerful and a deep medium for sharing history, culture and societal values. Food is also an ever-present object in society. It has been a common object across the centuries that is shared communally. It is a consumed daily to sustain life, yet it's full of secondary meanings and symbolisms. As an academic field of interest, food studies has developed into a multidisciplinary academic area, no single discipline having a monopoly over the food agenda due to food's interlinked nature with humanity. To be frank, however, the field of political sciences, and in particular food power studies, has not on the whole contributed much to the academic debate since the end of the Cold War. With the notable exception of R. L. Palberg's book on food politics published in 2010, with this in mind, I first took the presumed knowledge taken by many academics in the field as granted and reapplied this to how actors in the political sphere conceptualise and define food. Due to food's unique nature, actors in the political sphere usually conceptualise food in two broad definitions. Firstly, a political economic definition of food. The political economic definition's central principle is that food is a doubly consumed item i.e. an item that can be bought and sold, as well as consumed by the process of eating. Imbued within the political economic definition is the system of provision that surrounds food, containing the factors of production, the issues of production, and the market which the food was produced. Secondly, there is the cultural symbolic definition of food. In the cultural symbolic definition, food is both an object and a medium for levels of context, customs and ideologies, all dependent on the culture and society of the people who are involved in the act of the commensality. The additional meanings and symbolisms that surround food also give the ability to mobilise strong emotions that are not normally associated with a consumable object. The cultural symbolic definition varies from culture to culture and is constantly changing as outside influences alter what is seen as the norm of food inside the culture. Though hard to measure, the impact of the cultural symbolic definition is obvious with the consumption of food being able to signify to those inside and outside the culture the ethnicity, race, nationality and to a degree gender of those consuming food. These two definitions signal different ideas about food. The political economic definition is useful for understanding the production of food, yet is not sufficient for understanding much of the why food is produced or consumed in certain ways. The cultural symbolic definition, on the other hand, may illustrate reasons why rice is planted and how it is eaten, but not how much and by whom the rice is planted. Together they function to give a better picture about the farming, consumption and the culture of global food. 
I bring up these two conceptualizations now as these are the two main headspaces that we think about food. We either think about it as an item which can be consumed or an item that actually has value and many intangible things related to it which are all intertwined within the consumption. And this is just how political actors and entities also think about and conceptualize food. Now we all know in our gut that food is a source of political power, excuse the pun, but Due to a lack of conventional military application, food is not traditionally seen as a political power source that can be used. However, in modern international politics, military force is not enough to ensure a nation's safety. Thus, there have now become room for other forms of power. And as Joseph Nye says, power is like love. It's easier to experience than to define or measure. But for many years, the realist school of thought had a monopoly over what we understood to be political power. With military might, as the only source worth exploring, while economic might was also seen as a less decisive factor that contributed into military might. However, the grandfather of the realist tradition, Hans J. Morgenthau, in his 1948 book Politics Among Nations, listed food as an element of national power and described ways in which food can be utilised to affect power. Morgenthau examined food as a form of either prestige, in which he lists diplomatic function as a form of power, e.g. state banquets, and also as a way of hard power, of power that can be actually led by actually using food as a weapon, so to speak. So, for economy, in my argument, I will strip back what can be considered power to the ability to coerce. And so if we can use food to coerce, change opinion, change behaviour, food can be seen to have made a power shift in the international or domestic arena. Before I continue, however, I must point out that I'm conceptualising power as purely a psychological relationship between two parties, one as the wielder and one as the recipient of the power. This is coercive control on, on a psychological level, but the controller actually uses either hard powers carrots, inducements or the expectation of benefits, or sticks, threats or, and the fear of disadvantages, or soft powers attraction, so the respect or love of men in their institutions, to actually ha gain control over the recipient. Food, due to its dual conceptualization previously mentioned, can be employed by a variety of actors using either the hard powers, carrots and sticks, or soft powers attraction as methods to coerce. A warning, however, food, and of course power in general, is only effective in certain situations. Due to food's characteristics, it will not be effective as military power in certain areas, nor should it be. Food, just like every form of power, is more effective at coercion in certain issue areas than others. Just as the saying goes, you don't use tanks in a swamp, you don't use food on a battlefield. You use it where food is appropriate to be used, in an embargo situation, in a diplomatic situation, places like that that I will go into in a second. Now, let us look at who actually uses power in the political sphere. The nation-state, the primary actor in traditional international politics, has a very limited position for coercion through food. The nation-state has the ability to communicate messages and its culture to other actors. It can set its own agricultural production and utilise production for its own purposes, e.g. food security, food aid or embargoes. It can also direct manufacturing and the retail of food within and outside the state to some degree through trade. And finally, it can direct the consumption of food within its own borders through dietary advice, which all influence their own culture and also external politics. Nation-states, however, are not the only actors that can coerce others and affect the norms at global level. Non-state actors, or NSAs, are the alternative group of power-wielding actors that has grown rapidly due to the modernization of mass communication and globalization. The term NSAs is very broad, encompassing private companies, interest groups, non-governmental organizations, people's movements, and even individuals such as Jamie Oliver or Michael Pollan. NSA's power is seldom military-based. They generate power either through economic might or via support. Now, NSA's, I believe, are quite proficient at utilizing food as an issue to show their political power. Organizations such as the Slow Food Movement or even the Monsanto Corporation have all utilized food as power to some effect by altering political policy and national culture. 